I thought the way I'd start this morning, if you want, is uh, last night, there may be stuff left over that you want to, or you may have had a nightmare, <laughs> <laughs> or anything like from last night that you'd like to question or pursue or say whatever about it, and then I'll get into Paul. If you, if you haven't got any questions, or, or not only questions, observations, or... Yes, Peter. <laughs> I agree um, what you're saying that um, it wasn't God's will. God didn't send Jesus to be crucified on the cross. I mean, that's it. If Jesus, sometimes I'm asked that question then, if Jesus, if it wasn't God's will that Jesus be crucified on the cross, um, did he have to be killed? Okay, so in that case then, what if he lived on and kept doing what he was doing until he was 85 and had died a natural death? Mm-hmm. And I say, yep, yeah, that could easily have happened. And then it would be the resurrection that would be the final re- revelation of... I mean, however he died may be irrelevant, but the resurrection obviously would, have, would, would be the one that, that would still then have taken place. Like, is that... Or is that obvious or... Well, let's go, if I went back to basics, I'd say God is love, but people didn't know that. So Jesus came to give his life. Not die, but give his life. <coughs> so that's what he did. He loved. And in, it's only in the loving that he revealed who God is to the man on the cross, whoever it was, the blind man, all those people. They saw through him, they saw love in him, that's obvious, but they saw something else in him because the reason for his love was clearly his prayer, his communion with God. He said, you leave me alone, but I'll never be alone because the Father is always with me. So when they, as we all do, when they thought, how is he so loving, so forgiving, so free, um, they came, they realised more and more it was because he had this revelation, understanding of God. <clears throat> Therefore he revealed God in his loving. That would have happened however, whatever happened. Now the decisions to crucify Jesus were human decisions, they were sinful decisions, and God doesn't control our freedom. Um, sometimes we try and control each other, but God doesn't try and control anything. Because God is love. I mean, we're all adults. If someone tried to control you, really control you, you wouldn't experience that as love, I don't think. Would you? No. Uh, so, um, God doesn't control. That's, that's the essence. God is giving self, but it's always free. We can always welcome the love, or we can reject it, or we can be halfway between. So, I'm sorry, I wandered from your question. So I would say that what happened to Jesus wasn't anything to do with him, as it isn't anything to do with me, what happens to me. I mean, sometimes you, push it, you, you cause it. But Pilate's decision was free and dreadful. The high priest was free and dreadful. The crowd was fickle. That's all sin. So when we go on Calvary, which was the way he actually ended in life, it's something that he loved so much there. So that's really impressive. But he would have, whatever, however he died, he would have been impressive. So I don't think that's got anything to do with it. Now, the resurrection is a statement from God, really, that God is the way Jesus showed him to be. Jesus said God is love. God is life-giving, and when he died, he was taken into the mystery of God, as I will be, and you will be, we all will be. He revealed, God revealed God's fidelity to Jesus in the resurrection, so that would have happened anyhow. Is that anything Absolutely. Yeah, fantastic. Yes. I'm sure. I sort of want to dig into it a bit. Um, he said uh, um, <coughs> Jesus didn't have to die. Um, we had to die, sorry, because he's human. Yeah. But gone. Yeah. Um, so I'm looking back at Isaiah, um, what Isaiah said. Um, it says, uh, he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon <coughs> him was the punishment that made us whole. By his bruises we are healed. Yeah. Uh, so I think okay. that there was a plan. All right. Can I respond to that yes. okay. <clears throat> we've got to look at the prophets from the right angle 
I was brought up, you were probably brought up, we thought that here were the prophets, let's say Isaiah, uh, that bit is from about, that's the disciples of Isaiah, it's about the year 500, something like that, BC. So you've got a prophet who God inspires, <coughs> excuse me, and he foresees something that's going to happen in the future, namely Jesus. And then when Jesus comes along, for 500 years later, it fits perfectly. So that would indicate some plan, some design of God, some revelation of God back here, foretelling a future event. I suggest you scrap that idea and come at it from the other end. You've got <coughs> Matthew writing about Jesus. And he's writing to his brothers and sisters and aunties and uncles and nephews and nieces who haven't got it. Miss, they, they want to stay Jews, which is a good thing to stay. But the best way to be a Jew is to be a Jesus Jew. I mean, that's the point. He, he lived Judaism so perfectly. He's saying, no, no, come on, move on. Leave the stuff that's cluttering your life. Join this community that's it's a breakthrough. It's like flower on the thing. So here's Matthew. So how does he do it? He's trying to say to the people, as much as he can, look, Jesus was condemned by the high priest, so it looks like he was a bad and It looks like we should wipe him too. You know, if you're going to be faithful to Judaism, you should say Jesus was a heretic. But go back to your scriptures, go back to the poetry and the insights back there, and you'll see that he actually fulfills all that. Like he's the flowering of all that. Isaiah didn't foresee Jesus. That's not the way it works. Isaiah saw something. He saw what life was about. He's actually writing about the new kind of leader they need to take them back from Babylon to the, a new Moses, uh, new, to take them across the desert back to Judah. It's a very exciting time for them. And he said, this is the kind of leader we, lead, we need. And then he reflects on the suffering of his people. Uh, Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple was destroyed, the king was taken out of, into exile and all that. So he's seeing suffering, and that's, but suffering isn't the end, he's saying. He's saying in that poem that you quoted, suffering isn't the end. It's suffering if we love through it, that's the key, God will be faithful, etc., etc., etc. That's what Isaiah was saying, nothing to do with Jesus. But it's to do with truth and life and God and suffering and meaning. What Matthew does is say, look, go and read that again and then have another look at Jesus. And you'll see that he actually fits that perfectly. And not only perfectly, beyond anything that Isaiah could ever have imagined. Yeah. Is that all right, Sean? Well, come on, just keep going. In other words... I think... Yep. Is it possible that God may have inspired Isaiah to write that in a way that it would fit with what would happen with Jesus? without actually being an actual prophecy? That's a good point. Um, say that again, because you said it well. So is it, would it be possible that God the, or the Holy Spirit would have inspired Isaiah to write it without it actually being about Jesus, but inspired him to write it in such a way that it would fit perfectly with Jesus? God would have been aware of what would happen. Yes, you're into the most profound stuff there, Sean. Sorry. God, no, <laughs> that's why we should be going. There's nothing, no point in going. Um, see, there's no way I want to limit what God can do. <laughs> uh, of course. I suppose where I like to start with what's solid and there and then work step by step into the mystery. So starting as best I can from what's really solid is prophets were not foretelling anything. They were seeing something. The word prophet actually means to, to proclaim. It's the same. To, to, so he saw truth in his own environment and inspired by God, he gave a beautiful expression to it. That, that doesn't, that's, your point is still valid, I'm still there. So that's what he did. 
it doesn't help me, it may help you to imagine God because you see God doesn't this again doesn't answer your question but God doesn't foresee, God sees because to foresee would have to mean that the thing I foresee, you foresee would mean there's a future for God. Well, there's no future for God. God is timeless. Yeah, God is timeless. So God sees everything because it is, as it is. But what is depends on, in this case, the free decisions of human beings that are immense. Um, Mary's wanting to marry Joseph. You know, like God doesn't organise that. Uh, there's a couple here married, aren't you? You two of them? Well, yeah, well, that's your... <laughs> That's your free choice. <laughs> There's another couple where? Yeah. There. There was no free choice. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. That's very good. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> My eldest brother is the one I admire most and who died and never. He said, yes, he said, no. I chased her till she caught me. <laughs> Which is not bad. Uh, anyhow, I'll keep out of all that. Um, so all our decisions are free and God is the great adapter as all lovers are. He, uh, because this decision was made, God loves me in my situation. He loved Peter, is a good example. <coughs> Peter denied Jesus. Dreadful thing to do. Jesus looks across the courtyard at him and with hurt, of course, but with love. And Peter realises what a bloody stupid thing it was for me to do. I've never been loved like this before and I, you know, here am I cutting off the source of life. So he goes out and weeps, as you know, and then there's the story of his forgiveness and all that. So God adapts to us as we are, loves us as we are. Thief on the cross, this day you'll be with me in paradise. So we've got to get rid of, oh, now I've left your bloody question, sorry, sure. But um, we've got to get rid of the thinking that when I sin, God changes. That's the precise thing about Christianity. God does not change. When I sin, I turn my back on the light, so I'm not in the dark. And if I do it forever, well, that's hell. But uh, God hasn't changed. So that's really important. Otherwise, imagine if I was the prodigal son in the courtyard, in the pig yard, and someone knocked on the door and said, look, your father doesn't love you anymore which I probably half feel anyhow. What am I going to do? I won't go home. I'll just say, oh, bug it. And just get on, you know, do something worse or something. Because, but the thought that my father loves me, no matter what I've done, might get me to come home. Now, I think I might have lost the track of your thing. I don't know. Without trying to limit God, I, my simple way to look at it would be to say that Isaiah was inspired to speak the truth to his people at that time in a way that was powerfully convincing. And it's about truth and life, so therefore it's about everything. Jesus is the flowering who goes well beyond anything Isaiah could ever have imagined, because he does. But Jesus fits it and takes it further. And that's all I'd want to say, rather than thinking of God having a plan, because a plan seems to indicate that we're, it could, if we took it to extremes, that I'm a bit of a puppet, you know, like God's got a plan and I fit in with it, whether I like it or not, in a way, and so the plan goes on. I don't find that helpful. Um, maybe I should, but I don't. So we'll leave that a little bit. But, but you're right, sure, not to... It's so mysterious, so I'm not going to give you an answer. You know. Anything else from last night? You kind, good people? Anything that struck you that's troubled you or interested you? Or All right, well, we launch into Paul. <laughs> that's the aim of the game. Good, let's try that. <coughs> That's a little icon, of course, of Paul, uh, early 15th century. You may know uh, Rublev was a Russian um, iconographer, and you may know the one called the Trinity. I don't know if you've seen my room. That's, that's a one of his most famous ones. But So that's Paul. <clears throat> the biggest thing, well, I'll, I'll say it, and even though I'm not sure I'm saying what I mean, the biggest thing we've got to get if we're going to be truly Catholic, 
means all embracing. Catholicism is not a denomination. I mean, in the, in the phone book it is. They've got the Anglican Church of England, etc., and then we wear a list. Catholics have never accepted we're a denomination. We're, we're all embracing, should be. We're welcoming of everyone. Now, if people don't come and join another group, that's their business. But our dream, we keep the dream alive that God is for everybody, which is what Jesus said. Well, here I've got the world again and a statement Paul made. The God desires everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. So everyone. Hence the missionary endeavour of Paul and the early church and St. Patrick and the Irish missionaries and the whole thing, the whole world. The mission is about you and me, us, seeing someone, welcoming them if they want to come or be, uh, and never, never putting fences up, but always having a fireplace to warm people and welcome them. So if that's true that God wants everyone to be saved, that's a picture of the ruins of ancient Babylon, which was the evil empire, really, that the Jews were. Well, there it is. Well, everyone in every blooming house in that thing back in... 500 BC or whatever date you want to take, every single person in there was loved by God. Of course. And drawn by the Spirit to respond in love and live to the full. Now, didn't all do it. Some didn't bother. Some didn't get it. But whatever. God from God. <coughs> there. There's a Samaritan priest in modern history type of thing. Well, the Samaritans were loved by God. There's a, the temple. Everybody went to that temple. was loved by God. Now, they didn't all know it. And some would have said they weren't, because the Gentiles are out here. Well, they weren't loved, according to some of them. You know, the, or the Samaritans weren't. The Jews were and the Samaritans were. We're crazy human beings. We get so bloody small. But they all were loved by God. And, of course, the one who showed it was Jesus. He broke through all that stuff. So he, he's, he's the woman that, with the woman at the well in Samaria and, and you know, some, some of the good Samaritan story. There's, I'll show you that. That's uh, by Albrecht Acht. That's the, a Jew with the Torah. The Jews were loved by God, of course. There's a photo. I didn't take it, but I pinched it somewhere. Of Nazareth, Nazareth Market today. Well, everyone in that picture is loved by God. If you imagine that picture, that could be any, that could be Mary as a young woman, you know, back then. But they're all loved by God. And the missionary, the Catholic, <laughs> Christian, knows that. So the first thing we know about anybody at all is you're loved by God. They may not know it, but we've got to know it. And if we know it, we might look at them differently and not judge them and all the rest of it. I showed you that yesterday. That's Jesus there. This is Caravaggio, beautiful painting. And he's pointing to this bloke here, Matthew. And Matthew's got one hand on the money and the other one. And that's Jesus calling Matthew. The vocation stuff. Come. And Matthew, it's, it's, I think it's quite gorgeous, really. Matthew's saying, me? Because the only followers that Jesus has at this stage are Peter, who's there, Andrew, James and John, they were all fishermen from the Lake of Galilee. This bloke spent all his life robbing them. You know, checking how many fish they've got and taking a bit of extra. So you had to give the money to Herod. Well, you're not going to give all the money to Herod, are you? So he had to kind of add a bit so that he could make a living for his wife and kids. I mean, if that's the way it works. You know. So this bloke is asked to join Jesus and four fishermen. I think I would have said no. I think I would have said, oh, I'm in for a bit of comfort. I'm not going to join that bloody mob. But anyhow, there he is. So he's called loved. Jesus reveals who we are by revealing who God is. That's taking us right back to where I was last night. Who are you? You're a word of God. You are a word of God to him, and he's a word of God to you, and you're a word of God to him, he's a word of God to you, and the rest of us are all words of God to everyone, whatever. We're, that's what we are. 
um, Jesus reveals the meaning of our yearning for love. We're all yearning for love. We're all striving to know, to be real, to find our place in this incredible, beautiful, but buggered up world. In Jesus, God's self-giving is fully revealed. Peter saw it, now Matthew's going to see it, and these people around here have been all happened to them. Um, they see in Jesus what it is to be a man, a woman, a person, a human being, it is to be a word of God. And he did it perfectly. Well, we can learn to do it. Showed you both them last night. That's the Last Supper by Tintoretto, which is why the Mass is so important to us all, because that's where we come together and share in communion. Now, Paul, this is the beginning of our little journey. Jesus was crucified, probably, uh, there's two opinions, but probably in the year 33 AD, which means that Jesus was born before Herod died, so Jesus would have been about 37, about 36, 38, something like that. So in his middle to late 30s when he met a dreadful death. Paul's enlightenment, best call it, wasn't really a conversion because Paul had all this incredible energy and it was good energy, it was just misdirected. So when the light went on, he just took the same energy and faced it in a different direction. So it wasn't kind of a complete conversion, a complete turnaround. It was a, ah, an enlightenment. I think that's a good way to see it. That's another picture by Caravaggio on the road to Damascus. So that's probably within a year of Jesus' crucifixion. In the meantime, we know that he persecuted the church. He was so determined. He saw this rubbishy group called Christians who were running around thinking that Jesus was the revelation of God when the high priest had clearly declared he was a heretic. Paul was faithful to his religion and you know all that. So he was there persecuted. And he was carting them into prison. And he was there when they stoned Stephen, the first martyr, to death. And he approved of it, we're told in Acts of the Apostles. So Paul was wanted to wipe out this heretic group who who didn't give complete devotion to the temple and the high priests and the Torah and who was who ate with sinners for God's sake, and then the psalm says, I'll never eat with sinners, you know, if you're if with God, we only eat with good people. Well, how you eat at all is a bit of a problem, but anyhow, <laughs> that's what he was taught. And, and Jesus was hugging lepers, and God said, you're not allowed to touch lepers, according to their reading of the book of Numbers, and not allowed to touch them. So it's, they had these good insights, but they were all, as ours can be too, they were all confined, limited, surrounded with a fence, secure. We all want to belong, for God's sake. And to be a human being is to be part of a massive mess of humanity, but there's nowhere else to be. Well, Jesus broke through all that, because Jesus' point was, the only thing that matters is love. So you love, meaning give yourself. It doesn't mean do what you feel like. So, and these are some of Paul's statements that you can see here from his different letters. I re received the gospel through a revelation of Jesus Christ. How did Paul get the revelation of Jesus Christ? I don't know. He kind of doesn't really tell us exactly. It's too mysterious. But my understanding or feeling for it is that say, say you were a Paul and you were there to when Stephen was stoned to death. And Stephen died so beautifully. He prayed that God would forgive the people stoning him. He offered his spirit to God. He was such a lovely human being. And if you're standing there watching it, and you see this wonderful person whom you're persecuting, dying so beautifully, I mean, it's got to, got to start asking some questions. Then he started to load people into prison, men, women, kids. And they were so forgiving, so gentle, so non-condemnatory so accepting, so faithful, so real. I imagine that all played on Paul. And then on his way to Damascus, it just got too much for him. He had a breakdown. Um, he realised that he, he didn't know. He, like he was so sure of himself as a young man that he realised he'd got it all wrong. So, God, please to reveal his son in me. Have I not seen the Lord? 
C, you put it in C, etc. So that's his enlightenment that year. We know from his own letters, in fact, it's a letter I'm going to do with you in this session, but I won't do all of it, I can't. But three years later, after this enlightenment, in the meantime, he was in Damascus, he went to what he calls Arabia, which we call it Jordan today. He went down there trying to cope with all this and make sense of it. He went in like a hermit. He went to heart works up in the country to get away from busy life. So just to see what the hell's going on and in integrate it all. But three years later, he did go to Jerusalem for a short visit, a fortnight only. He met Peter and he met the beloved disciple and that was about it. Then, the next thing we know about him from the Acts of the Apostles is, this is really important in a way, is 45 AD, what's that? What's eight years later, he's invited by Barnabas, one of the early Christians, to come to um, Antioch in Syria to preach there, to be part of the teaching community. So that's, what was he doing between there and there? We don't know. He was just in Cilicia at home, eating mum's scones. You're about to get some of mum's scones now. Or soon. I'm sure you're all starving, eh? Mm -hmm. um, so that's all going to happen. And, but we don't know. But he went to Antioch and then here, 47, 48, so that's 14 years from his enlightenment, 13, 14 years. So don't be in too much of a hurry, it might take you longer. I did it 12. I was silly and didn't have a thought in my head, but anyhow, you never know. Well, you go when you're called, whatever you're called to. And so here's his first journey, and there it is, there's the map. So there's Jerusalem, that's Antioch, where he was called. Tarsus, that's where he was born. He did some study in Jerusalem under Gamaliel, the greatest teacher of the time, and was a Pharisee and all that. But he also, Tarsus was one of the big schools, the Stoics. So he, he spoke Greek, of course, and he studied Greek, and he was, he was brilliant in, in the Greek, Greco-Roman world, as well, and in the Jewish world. So he was perfectly the one to make the connection between Christianity, which is Jewish, and the Greek world. And he did it wonderfully, extraordinarily. So it tells you here that in how he was there in Antioch, and this is from the Acts of the Apostles, and how they had a discernment there, and uh, the community said, right, Paul, well, do, uh, first of all, Barnabas. Barnabas was going to lead a, a missionary expedition to this part of the world here, somewhere from Antioch. And Barnabas was there, and they said, Paul, would you go and help him? And they also took Mark, who was a cousin of Barnabas, a young younger cousin of Barnabas. So the three of them set out, and where did they go? They went to Cyprus, because that's where Barnabas came from, that's where he lived. So you go, start where you know. And Paul was his assistant. They came to the place called Paphos, we to find all this out in the Acts of the Apostles, which is a brilliant, lovely story of what happened. And uh, interestingly, he's called Saul, that was his name, um, when he was, as a Jew. But from this moment on, from Paphos on, the Acts of the Apostle calls him Paul. And there's every reason to say, I wonder why. Why, why, why was the change of name? And we find out, it's in the Acts, that the governor here, the Roman governor of Paphos, was actually, Paul is his surname, I'm talking about Beethoven or Chopin or something, they would to use their surnames. So Paul is a common enough Roman surname. His name was Paul. It's quite likely that the governor was so impressed with Saul that he took him under his patronage. It was a big thing in the Roman world, patronage. And he also said to him, look, I know where you should go. Go to Antioch, this Antioch here, and start there. Because that's where the governor came from. So he would have had a brother there and a sister there and a married whatever, and cousins. And he would have said, look, I'm only guessing now, but I mean, it's reading between the lines. It's quite likely. Because Paul did go off to Antioch. And then he went from there to Iconium, Lystra, Derby, all that area there, came back and went back to Antioch. We find out from Paul's letter, it's in the Acts of the Apostles, but it's also in Paul's letter, this. Back in Antioch, in the year 48, 
Certain individuals, we're told by Luke, who writes the act, who's a disciple of Paul, went round with Paul, he's a medical doctor, but he, yeah. Certain individuals came down from Judea. Antioch is north, but it's, Antioch is at sea level. Jerusalem's, I like that. So they went down, even though they're going north. You know, it's got to imagine all that. And were teaching the brothers, look, unless you're circumcised, you can't be saved. Saved means you can't find meaning in your life. You're on, you're on a side track. You're not on the main track. You're not going anywhere unless you're circumcised. These were Jewish Christians, good people, let's assume, who, well, Jesus was a Jew, the apostles were a Jew, Mary was a Jew, the early, you know, I mean, obviously, you've got to be one of us and then become a Christian Jew. You can't be a non-Jew. So you need to be circumcised to be able to do it. That's what they were saying. With good will, but utterly wrongly, because the whole point of Jesus, not the whole point, what Jesus revealed was that you can be and come as you are. If you're a Greek, you come as a Greek. You don't become a Jew and then become a Christian. You bring your, your Greek, Ukrainian, wherever you're from, Italy, Irish, anyone. Bring your culture. Bring you. Don't stop being you to become a Christian. Be you, but be a disciple of Jesus. So this group here, here's Paul's letter to the Galatians, which I'm about to start. It's those who want to make a good showing in the flesh that try to compel you to be circumcised. Paul writes back to them straight from probably, I think, in the year 48. None of this is certain, but it's probable. He writes back to them when he hears what's going on in Antioch. They came up and just read. But they also followed Paul through Galatia, the area we've just looked at, his first journey. And they were telling the people, look, Paul was too soft on you. You do have to keep the law of Moses. You do have to offer sacrifices. You do have to stop eating certain foods. You know, they were going back to the, all the restrictions of the cult of the Jewish sect. Uh, and Paul, so Paul writes angrily, painfully back to them saying, stop, don't let them trap you into all this again. You've been freed by Jesus to be yourself. Well, only they may not persecute the cross of Christ. Even the circumcised don't obey, don't obey the law. They want you to be circumcised, they can boast about you. We've got another convert back to us, us Jews. So I, my suggestion is that my understanding is I've, I've got some books here that I've written on the Bible, so it doesn't mean I know a lot, but there's a lot of books, <laughs> and including a book on Paul. I'll pull it out for you. You'll have a look at these later if you want to. So that's, that's a little tiny commentary I wrote on all Paul's letters. <laughs> Yeah, well, when you're my age, you just keep going, you end up, it's got 764 pages in it. So if you're really keen on Paul, you can have a look at that. Well, you can buy it if you want it, but not that one. We've got some upstairs you can buy. But that cost you $50 to buy. It cost me $50 to buy, to sell to you $50. So. Anyhow, so that's, and I'll give you all the eye, why I think this is the earliest book of the New Testament that we're about to look at, because the Gospels aren't written yet. These are the letters of Paul, and they're just letters, just letters. They're letters written to a community, a real community, in a real situation in Galatia, and this is what he has to say. Paul, an apostle sent by Jesus Christ. He had this, what do you call it, sense of being sent. He had a mission. That's not an extra thing, that's himself. But he, he's, he's able to do something, and he wants to do it, and so he does it. And he goes to the Gentile world to... Because Jesus was for everybody and not just the Jews. And he was the one who got it so clear that he travelled all these areas trying to... Uh, oh. Oh, that's why I put that there. That is me. That's my... That's in case you didn't recognise me. That's, all. that's my website. And what I now it's a good one, glad I put it there. Yeah, that's roughly what the website looks like. And that's it. And the picture comes up with a lot of other junk on it. But here is all these are talks I've given on the Bible over many years. And if you go down to Paul and click on it, you'll come up, it won't look like that, but you'll come up with all this. That's actually that book. So you can get it for nothing. <laughs> it's off the bottom. But here 
when you click down four lectures on Jesus that won Paul's heart, which I did last year, this is the second time I've done it. I did it for a series of priests. Uh, that's text files are there. So all the pictures that I'm putting up there are available on them. You know what I mean? That's why I'm showing it to you. Can pick them, or you can pick up the text, not what I'm actually saying, because I'm just talking around it. But a proper text. And over here, you can hear, listen to the lectures. Again, not this one, but you know, because of when it's been recorded. Oh, maybe you have been recorded. I don't know what's happening over here. But anyway, <laughs> that's a record of whatever. So is that all right? So it's available, should you think, gee, I like that icon. Well, you can find it on the web. And there's a lot of other stuff on the website too. It's got nearly 20 gigabytes in it. People tell me it's a fair bit of stuff on the web. Is that a lot? Yes. OK, well, that's what mine is. <laughs> This is very unfair, but one of my fellow seminarians when I was your age said to me, Mickey said, you haven't got an unpublished thought. <laughs> 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 and it was true. Anyhow, there we are. Let's get back to this. This is wonderful. These are, I think, not certain, but I think they're the first words of the New Testament. And it's not unrelated to the question you asked, Peter. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, what a lovely image of God. And the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself to set us free. Gave himself to set us free. Sin is, sin is anything that stops me living to the full. So it's a big pile of things can happen. And so it's whatever gets in the road of life is what sin is. Well, we've got to be, I've got to be liberated, you've got to be liberated, <coughs> so that eventually, please God, we'll just be pure. We'll be just loving, human. Wouldn't that be good? A human being like your grandparents possibly are by now, I don't know. Somebody, I hope you know someone like this, who's just... As a priest, you get to know a lot of people like this, especially when they're dying. You know, someone dying of cancer in the bed there, and there's nothing left of them. And you look into their soul through their eyes and they're just so bloody pure. And you're like you say, they've got to go straight to heaven. I mean, they're just, there's no, they're forgiving. You know, you know what I'm trying to say, I'm, I'm mumbling, but they're forgiving, they're caring, they're loving, they're accepting. Yeah. They're, well, that's what Jesus came to do, according to Paul. He gave, but he gave himself so that they would do it. Free from sin, from all the stuff in me that gets in the road, and free from the present age, free from being, well, what are the others wearing? Well, they've all got one, I've got to get one, or, you know, whatever, what goes on with all this bloody newspaper stuff and everything and the media, and it's not all bad, of course, but it's, uh, we can get caught up in it, and it's, it's not us. We want to be free from all that, to be you, because no, there's no books about you. Um, you've never been before, and you'll never be again, and you're totally unique. So if you're going to learn to love, you'll have to learn to love your way. Well, that's what Jesus gave himself to tell Peter. Peter, it's okay, Peter. I know you denied me because you lost courage on it, but I love you, and you've got a lot in you. Don't, don't. And Pete becomes the great St. Peter. Well, according to the will of God our Father, what was God's will? I'm, I'm reading between the lines and that's not care. God's will is that Jesus give his life. Give his life. Doesn't it mean die? <coughs> of course we're going to die. But, but, and when we're dying, hopefully we'll give our life. But uh, to give your life, moment by moment. This is what, how John put it rather beautifully. You'll know the truth. The truth will set you free. If the sun makes you free, then you're really free. That's the Jesus. Paul's core experience was being loved by God. I am Jesus, you're hurting me, was his awareness on the road to Damascus. He was actually hurting the Christian community, but, it, but Jesus was in love with them, and so when he hurt them, he was hurting Jesus, the risen Christ. Well, it left him with a conviction of the radical importance of love, that that's the only thing that'll actually ever free anybody. So if you want someone you know to be free, either be silent, don't criticise anybody, 
sounds like I'm giving advice, I don't mean that I'm talking myself out loud, but don't criticise other people unless you love them. I remember when I was at Chev, for example, going back a long time ago, there was one kid in the class, and he was in the school, because our boarders mostly, he, um, he was a... If you ever criticised him, you thought you were criticising him, not what he did, you know what I mean? He couldn't make that distinction, and he was... And I, I, just, I had the dormitory that he was in, and I remember, I don't know, he has stayed with me, the memory that... I, he needed, he had some things to learn, he was really dysfunctional, and he was putting other kids off, and he needed to learn this. But I can remember, I think I waited for six months till I talked to him, because I had to get the moment right, you know what I mean by that, don't you? you had to, just find, and I couldn't find that right moment. Um, and when I did, it, it, I did. I don't know how you know when you do, but you feel it. So I remember, what am, why am I saying that? Well, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, there's no point of criticising someone unless you love them. Leave it to somebody else to do the criticising, because you won't, it won't work if you do it. If I don't love you, I should leave you. Just let someone else do it. Um, but if I do, maybe I might be the one that can help you. And if you love me, love meaning care for or really concerned about, then you be the one that could help me. We need as much help as we can get. He had this conviction of radical importance of love. Paul did. Nothing we think, nothing we do can produce good fruit unless it flows from love. You know that. This becomes especially important when we think or act in God's name. I think that's why we're all pretty attracted to the present Pope. Not saying that Benedict didn't love people or John Paul II didn't love people, but and I'm sure they did, they're great men, Paul VI, but there's just something about this bloke who's all over. Who put those pictures up, did you? Yeah, yeah, that was like one of our last group meetings. Yeah, that's great, they're wonderful. I didn't know the Pope used to sneak out at night giving food to the poor. Good luck to him. He must cause total panic and all the people are supposed to protect him. <laughs> Isn't it great? <laughs> it's the simple, like, he attracts everybody. He's so simple and, well, loving. You don't need any more than that. Well, that's what Paul learned. Paul was a beautiful lover. Paul didn't mean any kind of love. But precisely God's love has expressed and made real for people in Jesus. Jesus was the one who taught Paul how to love. And he'll teach you how to love too. And me, because he is the perfect human lover. Everything including faith and adherence to the truth must be tested by love. That's why we don't, we're not impressed by bishops or archbishops or cardinals or anybody, God, for God's sake, who thump the pulpit and tell us what we should do. But they haven't asked us who we are. If someone comes along, and well, they have, but anyhow, it doesn't matter, and criticises me without wanting to know who I am or why I'm doing things, it's, it's pretty stupid, don't you think? I mean, it just doesn't work for stuff. And you shouldn't listen to them, because they can hurt you. Because they might say something truthful, but truth, the, the truth, is that God is love. So if I say something to you that happens to be truthful, so what? But if I don't say it out of love, it's wrong. Do you know what I'm trying to say? It might happen to me to get the right tick, but it isn't truthful because it's not revealing love. Now that's big, I know, but that's what Paul taught. Only God's love, the love of Christ poured into your heart or my heart, that has the power to transform the world. And it does have the power to transform the world. Here's, these are all Galatians. That's my letter I'm doing with you. Look, these are just selected texts, because I can't do the whole letter. But look, there are some who are frightening you. They want to pervert the gospel of Christ. They're frightening you, he says, because Paul's come home after this lovely journey, troublesome journey, difficult journey, but a lovely journey. And he finds all these people who are insecure, they're just starting off as Christians, these other people hounding them and saying, no, 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 you're not, you've got to do this, you've got to do that, you've got to do that. And, and Paul's saying, look, they're, they're frightening you. They're using fear as an instrument to get conformity. Well, we can do that. 
church did that for a long time. Uh, the church, I mean, people were treated as children a lot. And for example, the, the law, it's a mortal sin if you don't go to Mass on Sunday. What's that? That's, I don't think it actually is as bad as it sounds, but given my experience, all the beautiful people coming to Mass, they're coming out of love. But in a way, fear was used to get us to conform, which is not really an adult thing to be doing. We should be, it's like saying to you, look, it's a mortal sin if you don't go to your best friend's wedding. I think, oh, shit, I'm just going to go to the wedding anyhow. And you go to weddings because you want to go to your best friend's wedding. It's got to be, a, we've got to attract people, not use fear to get them to come. Well, any group can do that. Any person can do it. Well, they're doing it. They're perverting the gospel of Christ, which is about freedom, precisely about freedom. God was pleased to reveal his son in me that I became his son in me. Well, God wants to reveal his son in me to you too, in your way. I remember when I was young here in the novitiate, at that building where I am now, 60 years ago it was, and we read a book called The Imitation of Christ. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. I didn't like it then, and I checked it a few years ago, and I don't like it now either. But anyhow, that's another matter. We read it. And I thought the idea of being a, a Christian was to be to imitate Jesus. Well, it won't surprise you to know that I wasn't making much of a job of it. Like, how do you imitate Jesus? I mean, yeah. So I wasn't succeed, succeeding very well at all at all that. Then I went down to Croydon to the seminary and read this wonderful book. I thought it was wonderful then, anyhow, yeah, called hmm, One with Jesus, yeah, by De Jago, a Jesuit. German Jesuit. And he made the wonderful point, which was so liberating for me as a young 18 year old, that uh, no, 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 we're not supposed to imitate Jesus, we're to let Jesus live in us, which is really very different. So I don't have to be patient like Jesus, I have to let the patient Jesus live in me. And if I, to the extent that I do, I'd actually become patient, his patience. I don't have to love like him, I have to let him love through me and in me. It is me loving. You can see the difference when I'm saying that. It was really quite, well, to me at that stage, it was very, it was like, oh, I kind of got the message at last. That it's not about, because he said, I'm, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Cling to me, stay with me, stay like John is there on the breast of you. Stay there and you, you'll, you'll learn to love and you will become patient. Because I'll be living in you. I'm the vine, you're the branches, and you'll bear much fruit. This is really important, this line, because I've retranslated it, and I give you, I'll try and give you my reasons. A person is justified not by the works of the law, not by doing what the law says. Nothing wrong with doing what the law says. It's better to do what the law says than not do it, obviously. But that's not what justifies you, like when you're at a computer and you get it all lined up properly. That, that won't make, put you together. It won't make sense to you. It won't sort it out. A person is justified... Now, nearly every translation, including the one you open if you've got a Bible, it says, through faith in Jesus Christ. This is a big argument at the time of the Reformation. It's all over now. It's finished. Uh, theologians are all in agreement on this now. So it shouldn't exist anymore, though it can be by people not studying. But that's not what Paul says. Faith in Jesus. I'll have to give you a lesson in Greek. Can you put up with that? And it'll be really brief. You might have done French. You might have done a little Latin. I don't know what the heck you've done. But let's talk about Greek. In Greek... They have a form of the noun which is called the possessive case. They also have prepositions followed by the noun. So you can say in Greek, faith in, en in Greek, in Jesus Christ. You can say faith from Jesus Christ. You can say faith like Jesus Christ. You can, you can say all those kind of things. Or you can just use the possessive case of the noun. Faith. Jesus Christ faith, that's 
Jesu Christu in the genitive. So he's talking about a special kind of faith, faith that's to do with Jesus. But he doesn't say whether it's from Jesus, for Jesus, in Jesus, whatever. He just says, Jesus' faith is what you need. That's what he says here. It's the possessive. So the simplest way to translate it is the way I have here. The faith of Jesus Christ. The Jesus Christ faith is the faith you want. Not yours or some Irish missionaries or something, but yours. Your, his faith in you. And it's the point I made a couple of minutes ago. It's Jesus' faith in God was in be- immensely beautiful, trusting, even on the cross. So that's his faith. He gives that to you. When we're baptised, we're baptised into Christ. We share in his priesthood, all of us. We share in his prayer. We share in his spirit. We share in his life. We share in his faith. So the, the gift given you, faith as a Christian, is his faith. His trust, his openness, his holding on to, his looking to the Father. That's what justifies us. The faith of Jesus given us as a gift. So, unlike what some people said, we could get back to the Protestant Reformation, where they, they got it wrong, but the church got it wrong too, it was all, all, all it was a bit over the place, was, um, no, what you've got to do, I'll say I, what I've got to do is not do what the law says, I've got to believe in Jesus. And then I'm right. And you find them saying, so anyone who believes in Jesus, stand up, you're saved. So any of you who are half asleep and just sitting there, well, I'm sorry, you've missed out. So all well, that very comfortable person back there, what's your name? Fina. Fina, I wouldn't stand up if I were you because it would be such an effort. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm sorry, you're not going to be, you're just not saved. I mean, you can't, you can't have an effort. Anyhow, sorry, jokes aside. Um, it's, it's the faith of Jesus that is his gift to you. And so we want to make room for it in ourselves. So it's not what I do at all. It's not do this rather than this. We've got to get out of the road. We're not the centre of the sentence. Instead of doing that, that won't get me there. Receiving this will, welcoming it, receiving it, grateful for it, allowing it, believing it's happening, that will bring us into communion with God because we're in communion with Jesus and therefore with God. Faith of Jesus. Where to play? This is what it means to have His faith. Trust in Him. Open our hearts to His Spirit. Listen to His words. Obey His inspiration. Do His will. Because the will of God is always what will make you free. I've been crucified with Christ, says Paul. Well, he had crucified, not literally, he wasn't crucified, but he was crucified. He left his Jewish community. They all saw him as a turncoat and against him. A lot of the Christians in Jerusalem thought he was being unfaithful because he wasn't pushing Judaism anymore. He was going to the Gentiles and saying, come as you are as a Gentile. Don't, just love, learn to love and join the community. You're very welcome. That's what he was doing, and they were saying, no, 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 what, but what about us? What about our Jewish culture and everything? And, and you'll be... So Paul was not alone, but heavens, it, it wasn't easy for him. So he was being crucified, in, as a metaphor. It's no longer... This is beautiful, I'd love to say this one day. It's no longer I who live. It's not my ego anymore. It's Christ living in me. And the life I now live here in on the world, in the flesh. I live, again, the translations will say often, by faith in the Son of God. That's not, well, the Greek could mean that because it's ambiguous, it's open. I think it's much better to translate it. The faith of the Son of God. Loving me and giving himself for me. So that's a, I think it's a perfect statement of what it means to be a Christian is to want to let myself go, my ego, and let Christ live 
love in me and live in me, giving himself for me. I want to know Christ, he says in another letter, and the power of his resurrection, and I want to share his sufferings by becoming like him in his dying. Well, suffering comes to us. We don't look for it. Jesus didn't look for it. We don't think it's a good thing, but it's part of life. So when suffering comes, what do I do? Well, it would be good if I could still love through it and, yeah, don't, don't get crushed by it, but somehow. Still Galatians. Because you are sons... Now that's pretty important. A lot of translations today, rightly, because our English language is so male-constructed, as you women would know, it's made by males in the language, so there is a good tendency to try and pull back from the heavy male thing. And so talking about men, we talk about men and women, or women and men, you know, all that. And that's quite important. But this is one case where you better be careful about that. Because you are... You could say sons and daughters, because it's true, but you're missing something if you do that. Because when he says to me as a male and to you as a female, you are sons, it might be hard to pick up, I'm not sure. He's really saying you're living the life of the son, Jesus. Like, so it's we're living his life, whether we're male or female, it doesn't matter, it's irrelevant. Whether you're a woman or a man, you're actually living the life of the Son of God. So rather than equalise it, or appear to equalise it, because you're talking about our relationship with God as a son or daughter of God, that's not what it's saying. It's saying you are living the life of Jesus, the Son. Because of that, God has sent the Spirit who signed to our hearts, crying, Abba. When we think of God, we think Abba. I hope you have a lovely Father, what everyone does. I guess all everyone's doing their best, but sometimes. But if you if you have got a beautiful father, then that's a lovely image to have. I I did um, within limits and built us around a lot because we had eight kids in our family. Mum could have had twenty. Dad probably should have had about one. Well, I mean, he was he died at sixty and he, he never had good health. And he had a girl and six boys in a row and then a girl. And can you imagine living coming home from work? with a banshees tearing around the house, playing cowboys and Indians. and got, you, Her dad used to thump us a bit. I don't actually regret it, because every time I, I used to always think, see, I was a funny little kid. I used to always think, even when I got a building, I thought, if only you knew. Like, I was always in front. <laughs> <laughs> I should have got a building for that, 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 and that. I only got one for that. So I, mean, I always came out of the building feeling, so I won. <laughs> you know, there we are. <laughs> Got me through, and I don't want to make him sound like he was. A, he was very. And once he, by the way, once he built it, it was all over. Like he didn't far worse than his parents. I hope he's young parents. Uh, um, far worse than people when, that remind you. Dad never ever said, "I told you yesterday." He never ever said, "Like yesterday, that was gone. The building finished it. It's like a game, really." And after that, he loved you, and it was all afresh which I thought was great, because um, there was no hold there was no psychological punishment, there was no, did, you know what I'm trying to get at, there's, and that's a far worse form of punishment than physical. Anyhow, for, now look at this, this is Paul, for freedom, Christ has set us free, he loved freedom, because you can't be a saint unless you're free. We have to be free, we have to be freeing everybody from anything that's blocking them Especially the stuff inside, because that's the worst stuff. Um, no one can stop you loving. And stuff outside as well. That stops you finding and being you. There's a beaut story for you. We're all, you're all probably going to be parents one day. Unless any of you boys get the idea of becoming an MSC, then you'll have to put up with it, not having a child. But you'll have 500 of them. They'll be all over the place. I don't mean... <laughs> <laughs> I meant that metaphor. <laughs> you know, every, everyone's a, you know, you know, it's like when, you, when your parish priest is up to So, what was I going to say? Oh, yes, it's Michelangelo. 
you, you know all now about Michelangelo, I presume. And um, he worked in Florence, among other places. But in Firenze, there was this bit of beautiful white Carrara marble that had been broken off the mountain. They try and do it carefully, but this bit was broke off. So it was kind of like that and then like that, and it was an unshapely kind of thing. And Michelangelo used to look at it and look at it and look at it, and he couldn't work out what to do with it, you know, and, and nor could the others. So it was sitting in the, or lying in the yard for a long time. And then Michelangelo, the great artist, um, I don't know how to understand all this stuff, but he, he looked at it till he saw in it something. It was actually, anyhow. So then he had to chip it away to reveal what he'd seen in it. So there's chipping going on, getting rid of that, getting rid of that, getting rid of that. And what he ended up with was maybe the greatest master, David, quite one of the one, if not the greatest masterpiece in the world. And if you look at it carefully, you'll see the hips are at a, an unusual angle, and so he, but he saw it there. And I actually think that's a great image for being a parent, or a priest, or anything really, is um, instead of trying to make someone into what you want them to be, which can happen, every child is unique, so it just contemplative looking at a child, which, please God, your parents did, looked at you till they, they see something in you that you can't see. And then discipline, which is always necessary, is there in order to shape and protect and direct. But you're not directing the child to what you like to make. You're directing them because you've seen something in them that is beautiful and you want it to be there. And that's a good thing for priests too, in the parish or anywhere, to think of the contemplative looking till we actually see the person and then draw them out. Well, that's very liberating stuff. And that's what Paul's talking about here. For freedom. Christ has set us free. Stand fast, therefore. Don't submit again to the yoke of slavery. To the Torah or to anything. Don't submit to something that yokes you in and makes you another but doesn't let you be who you are. Follow love. Follow. Be free. And free from stuff inside, of course. This is great. You could hop, take the, write this out and put up like these things, put it above your shower recess or something. In Christ Jesus, the only thing that counts is faith working through love. Faith meaning openness to the mystery of God and let it work through love. Because it's the only way it does, because God is love. So there isn't any other way for it to work. Here it is again. You were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Don't use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence. That will be dreadful. Through love, love meaning giving yourself, gift of self, through love become slaves of one another. For the whole law is summed up in the single command, love your neighbour as yourself. So Paul was really the wonderful Jew. He took his Judaism, because he followed Jesus' way of being a Jew, into that. And he wanted people to come with him into that. And yet the Jews on the whole rejected him because they wanted to stay back unfree really within the limits of their cultural demands and practices and habits and so on. We can all do that if we're not careful. Here's Paul. The fruit of the Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus always, the fruit of the Spirit is love. So tick yourself, see how you go here. Love, joy, Nietzsche, one of the great German philosophers, used to say he, he would, he, Christianity could be terrific. He said if only people would smile at this. Like, Christians look so bloody miserable. Well, in his vicinity, they must have been there. So if you're a Christian and you're a tie, you're a lemon, you're kind of wrinkled on the outside and bitter within, well, for God's sake, get real. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Would anyone like not to be like that? Oh. 
I never boast as Paul of anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus. Right. By which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. A new creation is everything. But God said, let there be. Well, Jesus is a new creation. He's a new Adam, that's the way they talk about it. A new way of showing us that's what human beings are meant to be. That's what we're called to be. That's what we can be. So we link to him and let his spirit draw us into that. So this is the end. Two, two more of these. This is just my imagination. Now, if I were writing, if I were Paul, this is what I think Paul's saying to the Galatians. I'll read it from here. Uh, we, need, we need, my need, says Paul, imaginatively on that, my need is for communion with God took me to the law. I, Paul, was committed to observing every last detail of the law. Then, in his mercy, God revealed God's self to me in Jesus. I realised that the answer to my need was communion with him. I was attracted to him. I wanted to share his secret. I wanted to share his life. I wanted to be able to give my life in love the way I saw him giving his. The law didn't make this possible. When he embraced me from the cross and poured his spirit into my heart, my fascination with the law died. I fixed my eyes on him. I see that the purpose of the law has been achieved in the faith of Jesus. In giving me his spirit, he gave me a share in his faith. Now I can love, live for God. The love of the Father, God, into which I have been invited, the embrace of the Son, the communion of the Spirit, having issued or issuing from the pierced heart of my crucified Lord, has put to death in me the distracted desires that dominated my existence. The law of God has been written now in my heart, and with it the power to keep it. For I am a child of God, living already through his spirit, the life of the Son. May nothing separate me from this love, says Paul, and may nothing separate you, my dear Galatians. Amen. So that's, Paul, that's Paul's first letter, I think. Uh, and I think it's very beautiful. And it's all about you being free. It's great stuff. Um, well, I reckon it's a great beginning to the New Testament. So, thank you. So maybe we we'll take out of what we do now. Yeah. Well, does anyone have any questions or comments? We can I like that idea of Jesus loving on the or <coughs> Jesus loving up to the point of being on the cross, mm. and then the love being transferred to us and loving back towards the cross. Mm. That's a really sort of, I think, a powerful thought in life. Oh, beautiful, thank you. Thanks. I think um, sometimes when you try and be like Jesus, it's it's a pretty overwhelming thing. Because to live up to something like that, 
not impossible. Um, but um, through like the letters from, from Paul, I think it gives us very good insight. Of, oh, we didn't know Jesus either, like we don't. But it's through like things like symbols and, and and words that we can further understand. And through um, the eyes of the observer, rather than being part of it. I think it makes it a lot easier on us through scripture like this rather than just learning of what Jesus did. It, uh, it shifts truth from being searching for the accurate statement mm. to the heart, yeah. searching for the richest relationship. Yeah. Uh, Martin Buber is a Jewish philosopher. Really, you probably all know this, but it, what he says one of our problems with God is that we have like a I-it relationship with God. God becomes another object for discovery, for clarity, for whatever. So it's something God is like out there as an object of thought and inquiry and wonder, whereas the only, because God isn't an it, and God isn't something we can objectify like that, uh, the relationship with God is an I thou one. It has to be a heart communion with the mystery. And every time, I mean, for me to say, meeting new people last night and now, well, if I went away from here with an unchanged image of God, that means I haven't actually met anybody. Mm -hmm. but, you know what I'm trying to say? Because every, every new experience is a revelation of God. If our way, and we, we don't always get it, but sorry, we don't get there, but thank you for your comment. Mm -hmm. 